Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Martin, and welcome to Feet Forward with the Illinois Podiatric Medical Association. Uh, we've been off for a couple months, but we're back with a sort of a summer-themed, athletic-themed uh, sort of segment uh, tonight. Um, keep in mind that um, if you are in need of a podiatrist in Chicago, uh, you can call the 800 number um, on the screen there, or visit the IPMA's website, which is ipma.net, and you can punch in your zip code, and you'll get three podiatrists um, near you that you can uh, call and make an appointment with. And we certainly encourage you to do that, um, especially if you have any questions after the show that we're not, we're not able to get to. Now, normally we have a bunch of grizzled, experienced podiatrists on this show. So this is truly a unique experience where we have a, a brand new, freshly minted podiatrist here, Sarah Dickey. Sarah, thanks for coming. Thank you um, for having me. Uh, we know it's been a very hectic week for you. Your first week um, on the job yes. with uh, Dr. Michael Chin, friend of the program, uh, by the way, uh, a veteran of Feet Forward. And I'm sure he gave you a lot of tips on how to manage this and how to deal with me. Yes. Um, and I'll be discussing that with him later, so uh, don't worry about that. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, um, some of the training you went through in uh, pediatric medical school, and, and sort of um, what you experienced as a resident, too. I'd like to hear as much as possible about that, because we're very interested in how podiatrists are trained, what their scope of practice is. I think that's very important for the public, because we do get a lot of questions about What's the difference between a podiatrist and maybe a foot and ankle surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, for instance? So, so tell us a little bit about your training and background. Um, well, first, I did complete a four-year Bachelor of Science degree at Indiana University Bloomington and then continued on to podiatric medical school at Scholl College of Podiatric Medicine. Um, that's affiliated with the Roslyn Franklin University of Medicine and Science. So after completing four years at that institution, then you apply to residency. And that can be anywhere across the United States that you get slotted for residency. Um, my particular residency was a pretty unique situation. We spent my residency, I spent my first year at Cook County Hospital, um, working amidst a lot of physicians and surgeons that work at Rush University as well as, well as Northwestern. And then my last two years of residency was completed at Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center. Um, so it's a 36 month program, a three year program where you see everything from trauma, um, both of which were a level one trauma facility. <clears throat> and you also get to do a lot of elective things such as bunions, hammer toes. Um, you get to see pediatric deformities and just you know normal walks of life, sports medicine, um, a little bit of everything. So it was a well-rounded training program. Now, when you were at Cook County, did you spend a whole year at Cook County? Uh, an entire year, yes. Okay, and I'm very interested in your experience there because um, uh, that represents a, a patient population that may have more chronic foot problems. Yes. Um, is that the case? Is that what you saw too? Absolutely. A lot of chronic foot problems, a lot of diabetic patients we did see. Um, it's a level one trauma facility, like I said before, so we did see a lot of gunshot wounds. Um, lawnmower accidents, mm. pretty car accidents, pretty high intensity um, trauma that we did see there. But yes, like you said, a lot of chronic diabetic foot ulcerations and wounds and um, just poorly controlled diabetic patients. Now, when you were in, uh, handling trauma cases, were you part of a team or would they bring in a special team just to handle the foot injuries? Um, were you part of an overall sort of multidisciplinary team that treated these uh, kinds of injuries? So at Cook County Hospital, actually, they would just call the specialist that they needed. So say they needed, you know, um, a neurologist as well as a podiatrist, they would call the podiatry resident on call and mm -hmm. the neurology resident on call. And so we'd both kind of be in there triaging whatever problem need to be dealt with at that time. So it wasn't necessarily a team of doctors. There was a specific trauma bay mm -hmm. and there were specific doctors you know, kind of overseeing everything that was occurring. But for me, I was just focused on the foot and specializing in what we needed to have accomplished uh, to make the patient better. Did you say you saw some lawnmower accident patients Absolutely. too? Absolutely. Just yes. one or a couple? Um, Two, I believe, two. if I can remember. In yes. a year's time? That seems yes. like a That's, lot to me. Yeah, me one too. One is a lot, I think, but, <laughs> exactly. but two seems excessive. Um, it did. It was pretty interesting. How, how, does, how does someone injure their foot in a Lawnmower. Believe it or not, people like to mow their lawn in flip-flops. I mean, it's very warm uh, outside. They mow their lawn in flip-flops. They're trying to get it started. Next thing, they run over their foot and end up, you know, pretty giving themselves a pretty large laceration or cut in the top of their foot. Wow. Sometimes removing the entire toe. I've seen so. Wow. Well, we're gonna we're gonna actually talk about <laughs> flip-flops a little later on. We don't yes. want to spoil the whole show up fun. front, but. Um, 
I know that you work with um, Dr. Chin, who's a big sports medicine uh, yes. podiatrist, and um, he's probably going to force feed you a lot of that stuff. But we do have a lot of, of uh, athletes um, who watch the show, parents with kids that are in soccer, little league, football, starting in a lot of the um, uh, Pop Warner leagues and, uh, yes. and, and high school leagues, too. So um, we have a lot of kids that are active, of course. And that goes for women too. I was uh, actually watching the women's soccer game. Oh yes, uh, this, me too. Uh, this morning, so uh, we have a lot of uh, women who play soccer, obviously. So uh -huh. we want to give out the props to that. But let's talk a little bit about some common sort of athletic injuries that we're going to see during the summer, and maybe talk about the ways to prevent them. And I know that um, uh, I know that as a parent, you, your your kid gets hurt, and you want to make a decision about how to treat them in the home if you can. But then also. You know, should I call my doctor? Should I go to the emergency room? Yes. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how parents and, and adults with kids can, can kind of discern that um, sort of those differences and, and, and make a right choice. Okay. First, I'll just discuss probably some of the most common injuries related to sports or running and being active in the summertime. Um, I would say first and foremost, ankle sprains probably take the top of the list for the most common injury that we see and treat. Then I would say probably tendonitis, uh, inflammation or swelling around tendons from overuse injuries. Um, otherwise, arch pain, uh, which is sort of consistent with heel pain, plantar fasciitis. I'm sure all these terms people have heard probably. Mm -hmm. um, and then stress fractures from running in improper shoe gear and maybe doing too much too soon. Um, if they're training for something, whether it be a marathon, a half marathon, or just out running recreationally, maybe they push themselves too quickly. So I would say important things to look for um, if you do endure some sort of injury, anything swelling or redness or bruising lasting greater than 48 hours should sort of raise your suspicion as to something more is going on than just a typical tweak of the ankle or mm -hmm. tweak of the foot. So I would definitely seek a healthcare professional if swelling, redness, bruising lasts in an extre extremity for greater than 48 hours. Um, also, other things that you can look for is point tenderness. So if specifically on the foot, uh, you notice any spot that's really, really tender to the touch, that's another um, indication that you should probably be evaluated uh, by some sort of healthcare professional. You, now, tenderness, is that determined by sensitivity? sensitivity so it hurts? Or yes. the, the tissue is just a little bit more soft than normal or both? Um, I, I would say the first more than the second. So if you're pushing on your foot to try to evaluate, wow, is this just a bruise? What have mm -hmm. I done to myself? And you feel point tenderness and a very specific area on the foot, um, not generalized, but a specific point that could lead, um, you know, lead you to maybe seek some sort of healthcare consult because that could be a possible stress fracture. Mm -hmm. um, other things, decreased range of motion. So if you notice you're trying to move your foot and ankle up and down in a certain position that you normally do every morning when you get out of bed and try to take that first step and you have stiffness or inability to move it like the other side. That's an indication that you may have some sort of um, foot problem occurring or something that you've done in the days leading up to that uh, that you should be consulted for. Um, and then weakness. If you compare one side to the other side and you notice weakness in the foot or ankle, that's something that should raise your awareness and maybe help you to seek some healthcare professional advice. Um, speaking about ankles specifically, mm -hmm. um, what are things that people can do immediately after an injury? So you experience an injury, you're pretty much uh, unable, to, unable to play or yes. compete or continue running or exercising. Uh, what are some of the first things you wanna be thinking about in the next hour to 12 hours, let's say, after the injury? Okay, so if you're, whether you're playing soccer, volleyball, running, t-ball, whatever your interest is or activity <coughs> is, you should immediately stop the activity that you're currently active in. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would do is try to either get to the sideline or get to a cool place where you can elevate the extremity, the foot or ankle that you've injured. Also apply ice either to the top of the foot or ankle, wherever, uh, wherever you're seemingly having the tenderness and um, you should have this ice on for 15 minutes. And you don't wanna go any longer than 15 minutes because actually it causes the opposite to occur where you actually can get swelling. It can increase swelling if you leave it on for greater than 15 minutes time. So um, that's an important little tip. Also, I would say to contact a doctor. Like I said, if anything lasts or lingers greater than 48 hours, you have extreme swelling or bruising, that's the time you wanna seek uh, professional care. 
You had mentioned tendonitis as one of the other injuries, mm -hmm. and that's typically something that we see in elbows yeah. and shoulders, really, not so much in or in knees, for instance, but how does it manifest itself in, in feet and ankles? So typically we see tendonitis with overuse type injuries. Um, this can occur from improper shoe gear, which I know is a hot topic we're going to discuss, such as flip-flops, um, anything where you're walking for a long period of time in an inappropriate pair of shoes, that's probably the number one cause for tendonitis or overuse of a tendon or ligament in the foot or ankle. What are the symptoms of tendonitis? Um, I would say tenderness, uh, difficulty moving the foot or mm -hmm. ankle, um, pain, swelling, bruising even can occur. Um, but more or less, I would say tenderness in the area and tenderness with movement of the foot or ankle. With the, the difference between a sprained ankle and tendonitis, for instance, might be, does tendonitis occur over time typically? Exactly. Whereas a sprained ankle is something that's Acute. more um, right then and episodic, there. right? Exactly. So, and a sprained ankle is something you're going to recall, whether it's a misstep, you, you know. fall down, yeah. you fall off your bike or dismount off your bike and inappropriately, um, you're going to know instantly that that's a sprain versus a strain or a tendon tendonitis because the tendonitis is an overuse injury. So mm -hmm. over many days or many hours, that's when you start to feel that that sort of uh, pain. You'd mentioned you'd, you'd mention that shoes play a role in increasing the risk or chance yes. of tendonitis. Talk a little bit about uh, sports shoes, for instance, for the audience and how important they are in preventing these kinds of problems. Okay. Well, there are five different types of shoes out on the current market. Um, this is more or less for the running type of shoe. So there are neutral cushioning shoes. Um, that's going to be more for your neutral foot structure or if you have a higher arch foot structure. Then you have a stability shoe and also within the group of stability shoes you have a motion control shoe. And the motion control shoe is going to be more for the flat foot flat-footed patient or a patient that pronates. Mm -hmm. um, also other types of shoes, uh, the minimalist type shoes and barefoot running shoes, that's a really big hype right now with the five fingers. Right. And um, so that's another uh, genre of shoe. And then the racing flats that you see uh, if you're running the marathon or training for the marathon, a lot of the time or pace setters uh, run, run in the racing flats, but that's only for very experienced season athletes. Um, there's a lot of noise and buzz about the five finger or minimalist yes. shoes. Um, obviously, not every kind of shoe is is right for everybody. Correct. But what kind of person would you recommend that uh, look at those kinds of things, and what and what kind of people shouldn't be wearing those? Okay, so just I mean, generally, you should probably if you're if you're interested in pursuing buying a pair of these minimalist or barefoot running shoes, you should buy them with the intent of taking them to a podiatrist or a, split, a sports medicine a physician to have them evaluate your foot if you're unsure. But typically speaking, I would say a neutral type foot structure, meaning when you're standing, your foot, your arch, the contour of the arch doesn't necessarily flatten out or you don't roll excessively out. So you don't pronate or supinate. You're pretty much neutral. That's what these shoes are geared for. And if I'm not saying that if you do pronate or supinate that you shouldn't wear these types of shoes, but you should wear them on a limited basis. And all patients out there that are interested in wearing these types of shoes should really take the appropriate efforts to educate themselves about the appropriate break-in period. I mean, when you first start wearing these shoes, they tell you just to wear them for five minutes around the house. So, you know, people get them and they instantly want to pop them on and go for a one mile jog or something. And that's something that will cause tendonitis, could cause stress fractures. So it's, you know, it's a great tool that we could have in our, in our bag of tricks to help the foot to become more strong. Mm -hmm. That's the big, you know, the intrinsic muscle strength. That's what it's supposed to work on and, mm -hmm. and strengthen. And it's a great tool, but it, you know, you just have to use it in moderation like most things. Now on the other end of the popular footwear spectrum are the toning shoes. Yes. Which are sort of the opposite of, uh, the five finger ones, they have uh, additional uh, support in unusual areas exactly. um, opposed to, as, as opposed to typical running shoes. So talk a little bit about those if you could. So there are lots of different toning shoes out there. We've, we've seen a whole host um, of different companies put out a pair of toning shoes from MBT to Skechers to Reebok. And truthfully, I mean, they all have a place in society, but once again, it's for the appropriate uh, foot type and the APMA, IPMA, does stand by certain types. So you can always look for the logo on the box of shoes if you're looking to go out and purchase a pair. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I truthfully think that if, 
if it's something that you want to pursue, it does have a place, but once again, you shouldn't overuse them. You should you should do an appropriate break in period and you know, a lot certain times when you when you should be wearing them, don't go out for a hike, you know, an excessive four hour hike when wearing the toning shoes, maybe gradually break into them and do 20 minutes the first day or 15 minutes the first day and on even surface, just so you get acclimated to the to the type of shoe and how it moves the foot. The American Podiatric Medical Association has a list of uh, accepted or seal of acceptance products um, yes. that meet fairly rigorous standards that they put them through and you can see a list of those products on their website, which is uh, www.apma.org. Uh, we can't flash that up. We don't have their logo on the overhead, but um, that's apma.org if you want to get a list of those products. Um, so let's segue into um, the evil, or the not, the not so evil, <laughs> flip-flop. You mentioned them in the lawnmower incident, uh, yes. which is rather gruesome, but yes. certainly got my attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> We love talking about lawn and gar garden accidents here. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, 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 I still find it amazing that they're as popular as they are. They, uh, you see them in offices. Um, perhaps it's because of the casual business attire that's so popular. Mm -hmm. But you see people wearing them downtown, walking blocks and blocks. Yes. Um, you see tourists wearing them in downtown areas. Um, and they've really become popular because they are so comfortable. But um, that's part of their lure, and that's also part of their downside too, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yes. So flip-flops have their place, just like every type of shoe. Um, places that you should wear flip-flops to the pool. You know, if you're going to be using a public shower or a jacuzzi type setting at your gym or a pool facility at your health, health club, these are all great places to wear flip-flops. A place or a time, a length of time or place to not wear flip-flops is, um, like Chris said, walking the streets of Chicago, many, many blocks, you know, concrete, very unforgiving to the foot and ankle and to wear uh, a very thin flip-flop on the bottom of the foot with that being your only protection and stability you're going to possibly incur some sort of tendonitis or stress fracture or, or negative repercussions from doing so so I would limit them to the places where they really should be worn the pool um, for short distances short walks uh, maybe a transition, you know, if you're transitioning from one shoe to the next for five minutes, something of that nature. But nowhere, no way, shape, or form should you be wearing these shoes for long distance walking, um, up and down the lakeshore path, or uneven terrain, because you're just setting yourself up for a possible ankle sprain, st muscle strain, tendon, tendonitis, um, or stress fracture. And um, it should, we should point out that um, these do protect the feet from uh, certain kinds of germs and bacteria in yes. the um, locker room and in the pool area yes. like uh, that, that contribute to athletes feet for instance Correct. other kinds of things so talk a little bit about some of the injuries that you do see from people that overwear these or wear them for inappropriate amounts of times and uh, and, 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 and locations so very commonly patients come in and they complain of um, tendonitis specifically perineal tendonitis that's very common that's the tendon running on the outside of the ankle and when you're mm -hmm. walking you kind of don't have any stability um, with the with the shoes, as you notice, like a, a normal lace-up tennis shoe, you don't have the heel counter that's actually stabilizing the heel when you're walking. So that allows for more side-to-side -side motion. And that side-to-side -side motion is what really aggravates the tendons on the outside of the ankle. Um, also for patients with flat feet, they typically get the tendonitis of the tendon on the inside of the ankle because the arch, the contour of the arch collapses and it really puts some strain on that tendon where it inserts into the inside arch, inside portion of the arch. Other things, if you walk excessively long, you could even cause yourself to have a metatarsal stress fracture. Um, and other things like sesamoiditis on the bottom of the big toe joint, you have two small little bones that glide nicely with the big toe as you push off with every step. But these bones can get very aggravated if you just have some small piece of cushion between your foot and the ground and the lack of you know side to side control of motion and metatarsals are some of the small bones in the, f the feet right yes yeah, so and metatarsals are the long bones that are connected to the toes so the long bones just behind the digits of the toes that you see when you're looking down at the foot yes now um is is plantar fasciitis also a problem that uh, can arise from uh, overuse of flip-flops absolutely i'm glad you brought that up so plantar fasciitis anytime you you lack that stability in the heel and lack that contour that the athletic shoe provides through the arch you're gonna allow the foot motion to be wobbly because you're not having that stability and not having that contoured arch that's going to support the arch 
So every time you step down, it's gonna put increased strain on the plantar fascia, which is on the bottom of the heel. It originates at the bottom of the heel and goes forward towards the toes. So every time you're, you're each with each step, you're just running a chance of either causing plantar fasciitis or one of the other things I've already mentioned. And uh, since, since plantar fasciitis is such a common problem, we get a lot of questions about that. Talk a little bit about some of the treatments that uh, are sort of the primary uh, approaches that podiatrists take to treat it, and then sort of the spectrum of, of what happens too. Because I know there are a lot of stretches that people can use at yes. home to prevent it. So talk a little bit about that too. So with plantar fasciitis, first and foremost, um, the most important thing to know about it is it's usually localized to the heel and usually to the inside portion of the heel. And most patients relate that they have pain or they notice the pain worse with the first step out of bed in the morning. So if this is something you're feeling, definitely contact a healthcare professional. Also, if you've been seated for a long time at work or at a desk and then you try to suddenly get up and walk, these are typically the pains, this is typically what causes you to have um, a high intense pain in the inside aspect of your heel. Treatment wise, what we can do is we encourage stretching because the posterior muscle group or the group, the calf muscles as we, as we see and know, um, they give muscles and feed off into the Achilles tendon and then the Achilles tendon actually give, give fibers for the plantar fascia. All of these are related, so if you have a tight calf muscle, then it leads to having uh, the potential for having a tight plantar fascia, and that can cause aggravation of the plantar fascia, which is known as plantar fasciitis. So things to do, stretching. Every morning before you get out of bed, if you have a sheet or a towel that you can loop underneath the base of your foot, the ball of the foot, and just gently pull the toes towards you with the knee extended straight, and just hold that stretch. That in itself, if you did that every day, two to three times a day, that would help to alleviate the potential for plantar fasciitis, as well as if you're having heel pain currently, it would help to dissipate or try to take away the heel pain. Also other, other self-treatments, um, always ice. Icing of the heel is helpful. What I do is I freeze a bottle of water and I put it, when I get home from work, I put it on the floor and just roll my foot, put it directly underneath my arch and mm -hmm. kind of leave it there for 15 minutes. And it's easy, you know, you throw that back in your back in your freezer and then you get it out the next day. That's kind of my ritual. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy thing to do. I want to ask you about the uh, the pain in the morning because yes. so many other problems uh, that happen with feet and joints hurt after you use it a lot. Exactly. But with plantar fasciitis, it hurts when you aren't using it yes. first thing in the morning. And that exactly. seems counterintuitive to a lot of people. Well, it has to do with like what, what I was saying, the posterior muscle group. Naturally, when we sleep, most people curl up in the fetal position. And if you take note of how the position of your feet when you're sleeping, they're plantar flexed or they're naturally, they're not held at 90 degrees with mm -hmm. relation to the leg. Mm -hmm. So with the feet getting plantar flex, kind of those muscles tighten up, they contract throughout the night. And then when you take that first step, it's like, you know, really, really ratcheting the foot back in the normal position that you need for ambulation. And that's what causes the increased strain and tearing because of the tightness of the calf muscle. Okay. Well, we have our first caller right before the end of the show. Perfect. Never too late. Go ahead, you're on feet forward. Yes, uh, I'd like to know what to do about uh, calluses on the bottom of my feet. Okay, are the calluses directly under the ball of the feet, or are they sort of dispersed throughout the plantar or the bottom of the foot? Yes, they dispersed. Dis dispersed everywhere. So a couple of things you can do. Um, over the counter at Walgreens and different facilities, or if you need a prescription, um, urea cream, it's spelled U-R-E-A. It comes in different strengths. That is very good. It's a keratolytic, so it actually helps to exfoliate the dead skin. And then it'll, it'll get all that dead skin off for you. So you can start the reparative underneath, reparative phase underneath, so your skin can become smooth. But if it is truly under the ball of the foot, we, we would probably have to take a closer look because a lot of times the reason calluses form is because of pressure. It's the body's way of protecting the underlying bony structures. So maybe your metatarsals are more prominent than other people, or maybe you have some fat pad atrophy under the ball of the foot where we're supposed to have natural fat. Um, so in saying this, if, if they don't go away with a simple over-the-counter treatment, 
um, you may sh you maybe should go see a healthcare professional to get an X-ray or just be evaluated for possible metatarsalgia or you know really low metatarsals or fat pad atrophy. Okay, thank you for your call. We're almost done here. Uh, we will be back next month. Uh, thank you for your time, Dr. Yes, Dickey. You, you were fabulous today. Me. And again, for the caller, anybody else watching, if you need a referral to a podiatrist in Chicago, uh, go to www.ipma.net. You can also search for us on Facebook and Google at Illinois Podiatric Medical Association. We'll see you next month. Thank you.